The following program was made possible thanks to the generous support of our Kickstarter backers. Sup, Holmes? Beware! Your host, Jonathan Holmes! Thanks so much, Super Bowl Sunday with Sinistar and Andy Wallace. Can it get better than that? Yes, it can. Toon Link Amiibo. Wow. I don't know if you care, Andy. Do you care about Amiibos? I mean, I think they're cool. Yeah? I, I don't have any. I don't have any personally. But. Huh. Well, I, I don't blame you. They're, I mean, I like them. Like when, when Skylander came out ages ago, I was like, that's rad. So huh. I, I like the idea of the little figurines. Yeah, it is a nice idea, and it's strangely <laughs> compelling. It it speaks to there's a lot of debate about amiibos. I'm gonna un- unbox this amiibo yeah, live on subhomes right now. There's a lot of debate on amiibos. A lot of people saying, "I'm sick of this pointless amiibo stuff on Destructoid." And then we say, unlike the video games we write about, like, <laughs> is there any point to any? Isn't this all about fun? It's just about having a point. Yeah, I've I've also always found that if I'm not interested in Amiibos, I just don't purchase them. And that's pretty much solved the problem. That is a neat idea. It is funny. <laughs> and it's, it's it's actually flattering. That's a pretty good detail. Yeah. Over no, there. I like them. They're cool. I like them. The little yeah. figurines that do a thing in the game. Like, I got desktop toys that don't do anything with my games. So. Well, they kind of don't do it. They almost do something. They're still figuring that part out. Yeah, well, whatever. You know, they. I like <laughs> the Nintendo Go Scattershot with its stuff. I like that a lot. And it's really interesting that, to me anyway, the Wii U has sold less than 10 million units. Yeah. And it, they're making uh, money hand over fist with Amiibos that barely do anything. And their attach rate is, is nuts. Like uh, Mario Kart 8 has sold like almost 5 million units. That's wow. almost uh, 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 one to, 2 to 1 or whatever yeah. attach rate. It's uh, like almost half the people who have a Wii U have one. It's pretty pretty interesting video game business. I don't know if you ever cared about the business side uh, <laughs> or whether you are simply a creative. Uh, well, you know, I'm a creator who also tries to make money, so I wouldn't say, let's say I'm not good at the business side, but I'm interested in it. <laughs> well, it's pretty... You know, I want to keep my lights on in my apartment and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you full-time at this point at game development? I am full-time game development. So I work for a small studio named Golden Ruby Games in New York, um, and then I do my own stuff uh, just as my like, solo practice. So like, Particle Mace is just an Andy Wallace project, um, but Extreme Exorcism is a different game we're working on right now over at Golden Ruby, which will be out, among other things, on Wii U. So hopefully our attachment rate is as good. I was, I was not aware of that uh, Extreme Exorcism was going to be on the Wii U. I was aware of it in general. Yeah, I, I it was going to be on most of the major consoles. Huh. What is yeah. it built in? Unity. Ah, that's how you do it. You don't yeah, it makes life a little, a little easier. <laughs> not entirely was... easy, but easier. <laughs> yes, easier. I don't yeah. know. Are you in uh, programming, design, art, all of the above? More or less all of the above. Less on art by a lot. I tend not to do the art, but yeah, I program and design for the most part. Um, like Particle Mace, I did all the art. Um, but, you know, Particle Mace has a distinct vector style to it. Yeah, beautiful kind style. Kind of way to work within my limitations. Right, right, right. Uh, and those limitations sometimes inspire uh, things that wouldn't happen if you had every tool at your disposal. So when did you get into this whole video game development thing? When did that happen? Uh, ages and ages ago. I mean, I remember when I was, like, three drawing Mario levels out on my parents, like, butcher... We'd get rolls of butcher paper, and I would just, like, draw whole levels. You know, I wasn't making games at that point. Uh, I started programming when I was in, like, eighth grade, and i just tinker around with things. I did a whole lot of Flash stuff in college. I was doing a lot of freelance Flash work. I got one or two games that, like, were, like, shown on, like, IndieGames.com or whatever, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm real! And then it would make, like, $3 on Congregate. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, whole making money part again. That's the yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I, you know, it was really fun. I used to do a lot of um, because again, I can't draw at all. I used to do a lot of collage-based games. Like I don't know if you saw my site, Isabel Poppy and Bling. That was a game I made a while back. Tell us about Isabel Poppy and Bling. Why? Why yeah, wouldn't yeah. I want to hear about that? What the heck is that? Yeah, you got like any kind of coverage at all. Uh, not that it got a lot. Uh, but so pretty much I was contacted because I was doing a lot of music videos at that point too, just animated music videos. And I was contacted by this guy who wanted me to do a music video for him. And I listened to the song. I was like, oh, there's like three really distinct sections here. I was like, maybe I can do like a series of mini games. I was probably like very into WarioWare at the time. Um, so I made these three surreal mini games that linked up with the music kind of 
Uh, all the games are a little broken. <laughs> That's okay. But, um, Isabel, yeah, Poppy, no, and Bling. How do they play? Yeah. Starting with Isabel. Yeah, so, I mean, it's not really... You play the same little character in each of them. Uh, the game, the song was just called Isabel, Poppy, and Bling, so I went with that. And I think it's embedded on my website here. Yeah, I have it open now. But So I just did all this collage stuff. I had a lot of fun. I was really into Larry Carlson, who is this psychedelic flash collage guy at the time. Huh. Uh, he, he has a ton of fun, often very not work safe, like insane psychedelic flash projects. And, uh, and so around was, when was this? When uh, was this? Let's see. That was this was like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, around there. Oh, I would have wow. still been in college. Okay, so about six years ago, maybe longer, huh? Yeah. Uh, and you went the psychedelic route for Isabel, Poppy, and Bling. Yeah, I mean, I'm always drawn to that. Huh. Um, I just I just don't like when people say that I must have been so stoned when I was making the game because I was like I wasn't I just making things. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, something people have said about me. I've never even smoked reefer, but ever since I was a teen, people assumed I must. Yeah, be trying I was so. like, no, maybe I just got good ideas. Maybe that's all it is. I don't <laughs> well, it speaks to the, the. I don't know if you've experienced this uh, in general in life, but when you have an idea that somebody else might not have had, uh, that sometimes inspires in people this kind of distancing and uh, dismissing language, like, "Oh, he must be doing it for attention, or he must be high, or sure. he must just be weird for the sake of being weird." I used to have hair almost exactly like yours, actually, except for a little longer. <laughs> And people just assumed I did it because I was uh, trying to stand out and it was about my image, but it was, in fact, my way of rejecting caring about image by, by just doing something that I knew nobody would uh, immediately think, whoa, that's the way hair ought to be. I was <laughs> kind of freeing myself of thinking about what, what ought to be and what not ought to be and not even worrying about it and trying to just be natural and be myself. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 you seem like the artistic type. Is that right? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. <laughs> and you went to college for art design, game design, electronics? So, no, actually, I went to... My undergrad was just a CS major. Um, oh, yeah. And then I just did I just did Flash stuff when I could. Oh. I would, like, make a little bit of money off it, and also I thought it was exciting and fun. Yeah, um, yeah, I still... Yeah. I always have a soft spot for Flash. I'll be sad when it finally, like, really dies. But, um... Didn't and then you after say that, it was actually dying, Flash? Did yeah, you hear I've been hearing that for years. But also, I haven't been on top of it. It might be. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then I went to uh, Parsons, and I got my MFA in design and technology. Oh, wow. That's not easy. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, Parsons was super, super formative uh, in terms of my practice. And how long ago was that? Uh, let's see. I graduated Parsons in 2012. Oh, okay. So pretty recent. Huh. Yeah, yeah relatively recent. So computer science, uh, undergrad... Uh, art and design, uh, post grad. Well, design and technology. Like design I, and technology. I probably learned more programming while I was at Parsons than undergrad, to be honest. Um, really? I also learned, you know, basic design stuff. They had this whole boot camp program. It's like a really like a three week intensive before you show up, just to kind of get because people come from really different backgrounds. You have mm -hmm. like fine arts people, you have film people, you have programming people, like myself. Um, and so it's this three week intensive, and the web section was like fine but new to me. The programming section, I was like, I totally know how to do this. We learned processing, which I didn't know, and I had a lot of fun with. Mm. But I was like, oh, processing is rad. I can totally do this. And then the design section just killed me. Um, so it'd be like, you know, make some, like, colors that work nicely together. And, like, most of the students in the class are like, why are we doing this? Like, I have four years of experience with this. And I was like, I don't know how colors work at all. No idea. Like, I'm just going to throw a bunch of shapes here, and then you're going to tell me it's terrible, and I'm going to go home and cry. But this like is well after Isabel, Poppy, and... Oh, I'm blinking. Like, and Bling. Yeah. And Bling. Uh, is there a Bling in Isabel, Poppy, and Bling? There isn't. Um, no, there's no... Uh, I don't think there's any Bling. I don't think anyone's got jewelry. I might have put, like, a ring on the, like, toucan gorilla thing. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> People ought to check this game out, I can tell. Right away. Uh, <laughs> no, I, mean, so... I wasn't, like, totally ignorant about this stuff. I just had no formal experience, and... Mm. Um, having a little bit of that injected into what I was doing made me much more mindful about creating things and just all around better at it. So yeah, Parsons, super rad. I love Parsons. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds, uh, as a student as well, that you were open to knowing that there's a lot that you didn't know. And that in itself is a form of intelligence that I think a lot of people take <laughs> for granted. M most of the least smart people I know think they know everything. 
and uh, and aren't sure. uh, looking to try to learn anything, but you were aware that there was a lot you weren't aware of and you wanted to get yeah. into that. And I think that was the general vibe of that program. I think pretty much everyone there knew that there were a lot of interesting ways to expand their practice um, that they didn't know right now. And that's one of the things that made it such like an exciting, vibrant, and creative space was that all these people came from really different backgrounds, and no one was really trying to make the same things. It wasn't like a game program. There were games people in the program, um, of which I was obviously in that group. Um, but a lot of people weren't. A lot of people wanted to make, I don't know, digital sculpture, or do web stuff, and that kind of thing. And so a lot of people came from one very different sphere and were trying to build something in a totally different sphere, and the result was that the lab always had lots of, like, just interesting stuff happening at any moment. Hmm. Lots, of, lots of really smart people there. <laughs> it sounds like an art school, but an art school of the future, like a post-painting... Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, and Parsons has a lot of fine arts programs as well that are just about painting, but MFA DT, the design and technology program, was really about, yeah, this kind of forward-looking mishmash of abilities is super good. <laughs> but then the thing about art school, as I know, because I'm an art school graduate, believe it or not, uh, undergrad, it's not as though you can take that degree and then get a job. Like, it's not about so much jobbing. At least it wasn't for me. Maybe it was for you. Sure. Where there, where I mean, you know, it, de it depends on the skill set and all that. You know, I knew I wanted to do game design, so I strengthened my game design abilities. I strengthened my programming abilities, focusing on game design, picked up the ability to make some other kind of interactive art as well, which I enjoy doing, although I don't do as much these days. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I was hunting for jobs. I knew I wanted a game design position probably with programming. So, like, I can do those things. I'm good at them. So... So did you, you shoot know, so right out to, like, EA and Activision and stuff like that, or were you thinking... <laughs> no, no, I... I um, you know, I think that the whole AAA design thing is totally valid, uh, but it isn't what interests me particularly. I like to be more hands-on with the stuff I'm doing. I like to have a finer degree of creative control. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I joined up with Golden Ruby Games almost immediately... Uh, my girlfriend actually found a job listing on Game of Sutra and was like, you should check this out. And I was like, yes, they should. Um, and so that worked out. Awesome. Uh, and what and else has Golden no, Ruby... I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. Such thing. And then I have, you know, I work on my own things besides that. Right, right, right. And what else? I'm not as familiar with Golden Ruby as I would like to be. What else have they worked on? So we, uh, we don't have a ton of games out. Our first game was um, this iOS puzzle game called Destroy All Color, which... Um, in practice, worked moderately well. In theory, I still really love it. Mm -hmm. it, um, it was a color matching game that actually used your camera, so you'd see your screen was like see-through, so it just showed the camera image, but had these color blocks on top of it, and a block would light up, and so that's where the next block was going to be, and you have to actually point your camera at something in your environment that's the color that you want it to be. Ah, oh, cool. So it's like a match three where you have to be spinning around like an idiot, um, and also I found out it's entirely impossible to show it to people in bars because it's too dark. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, speaking of WarioWare again, uh, there was a DSiWare exclusive WarioWare game that I really wanted to love, but it, it was always too dark in my house, like unless I played outside in the sun. <laughs> <Not mad>. Yeah. <laughs> Even I, I, I went into my bathroom and brought like three lights just to review it, and I was still like spinning, trying to get it just right because it was a game that it, it didn't uh, match color, but it looked at you and you had... Yeah. Do stuff in the camera in order to. So uh, very forward thinking right there. It's. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm pleased with that one, even if you know didn't break the bank. Uh, and the next one we did was Worm Run, which is a procedurally generated uh, runner where I wanted to have a very kind of like uh, parkour is an overused word for this kind of thing, and it's not Mirror's Edge, but um, but very kind of jumpy. You've know, you got wall hangs on that. I wanted to do a runner that wasn't just like you move side to side, like this tunnel turns and moves up and wiggles all around. And you have to keep jumping along them and just avoiding this gigantic worm that's chasing you. Oh, um, so you're running from a worm. You are not a worm. You are not the worm. You are running from this monster, and it generates this whole cave for you. Oh. Uh, and it was my first foray into procedural design, and I'm actually um, quite pleased with that one. That's, that's one of my favorite games I've ever made. Uh, that is available on iOS, Android, Amazon Fire TV. No joke. Neat. Yeah. So you can play it <laughs> on your TV. You can play it on your TV. I'm like always fingers crossed that Gary Busey is playing Worm Run on his Fire TV. <laughs> there are uh, Amazon has been reaching out to try to get more good games on Amazon Fire TV, but it, it pains me. And this is the business part again. Uh, there are certain consoles that people just assume aren't going to be curated for them, and so it goes back yeah, to what we were talking about. It, it's tricky because 
Yeah, the, the Amazon Fire TV, it's actually a reasonably good console. The controller is actually quite nice. I like the controller they have for it. Um, you know, it's not, like, my favorite, but it's good. Everything about that console totally works, but, yeah, the user base just isn't there. Not for this I, kind of game. I wonder why that... Um, people just assume they hear Amazon Fire TV and they think, not for me. They see Amiibos on Destructoid and they say, I'm mad because Destructoid is supposed to be for me and you're talking about something that's not directly for me. People want to be... Curated sure. I mean, I think part of it, though, is if you're someone who wants to play these kind of arcade games, you're probably going to own a console before you own an Amazon Fire TV. Mm -hmm. And you already have a smartphone, probably, and you certainly have a computer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people just, they already have their gaming platforms and not looking for a new one. Yeah. They, that's my theory. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, the, I, and I'm also guessing people don't know exactly what it is. They know Amazon wants to sell them things. They know yeah. Fire is uh, hot. And it's also sometimes a wire, and that's all they know about that. And TV, I've already got one of those. So the, they're probably the, – this whole messaging thing is really, really tough in, in terms yeah. of communicating to a large amount of people that you have value and also clearly communicating what you even are. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer there. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll figure it out someday. I was at Target today getting this Amiibo, and I overheard a boy – uh, and his mother were looking at the Wii U, and the boy had these really, like, he was like a cyborg or something. He had, like, glasses that were, like, glowing around the edges, and he was probably, like, eight years real small. And he's like, oh, Wii U! And his mom was like, what's a Wii U? And he went, it's a Wii, except smaller, and you can play it on this thing! And she was like, get away from that. Like, she did not want to buy another Wii. But the, even the, the, the kids today... Uh, unless messaged to, they they don't even know what a lot of this technology is. That's yeah, I mean they do it. I mean, yeah, Fire's not aimed at kids. I mean, Amazon's whatever. But you know, Amazon will figure that thing out. I don't think Amazon's in any danger. <laughs> no, they've got plenty of money. Yeah, um, they're not. They don't speak to the underdog that that people <laughs> want to get behind. Uh, no, not not yet anyway. And uh, uh, speaking of underdog consoles that are. Up and coming, thankfully. Uh, our next game, Golden Ruby. I'm just going to run through all of them. You got me on the show. I'm doing the pitch here. Please do. I love um, it. Was uh, Hermit Crab in Space. What is Hermit, Hermit Crab in Space? Yeah, so Hermit Crab in Space is a PlayStation Vita game. Um, that the first Indicate East in New York, like two years ago, they um, they ran this, Sony ran this jam to make PSM games. And um, and we actually, we were a finalist for that, and then we wound up winning the whole thing, which was rad. We got some marketing from Sony. So Hermit Crab in Space is a modular space shooter, a little bit like Captain Forever, um, where you build your ship up, by you shoot pieces off your opponents, and you drag them onto your own ship. But then the rub of it is you need to aim them and assign them to a button on your controller. So it's just this, like, very slow, confused, nautical adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of, like, shooting your own ship off, or, like, half your ship gets blown off, so you're all unbalanced, so, you're, like, you're always spinning when you're trying to thrust or something. It's, it's good. Uh, and that was good. actually, that got us, um, that was my second Indiecade nomination. That game was the uh, finalist Indiecade that year, which was really exciting. Cool. What was the I first one? Uh, okay. uh, the first one was my thesis project, Find Me a Good One. And that looked like a hand-drawn, dreamy, weird time. So, yeah, I made, um, that was my thesis project at Parsons uh, for my MFA DT, and I worked on that with another guy who's in my year, Haitham Anasser, who's just absolutely brilliant, and he, he drew all of it. Um, oh, cool. And he, he regularly makes just these really incredible, radical, like, experimental games, pretty much. He actually, he's a big proponent of destroying the word games forever. He doesn't think anything should be called a game. He thinks it's a bad label. Huh. Uh, and, he, yeah. Hytham and Asser does very, very good work. <laughs> I'll say that much. He also always has the best Facebook pictures. <laughs> I'll look into that. I'm curious about, and I'd have to ask him directly, but since we're on the topic, what do you think of the, the label game? Do you think it's uh, suffice and no label is perfect? Oh, I, fine. I mean, I use it. I call myself a game designer. I, I don't have as much an issue with it. I also, my opinion on games is if you're interacting with something in a way that's meaningful for you and you want to call it a game, then like, yes, call it a game. Like, why are we worried about this definition? Mm -hmm. It's a game. It's a game. If people are wondering if it's a game, it's probably a game. I guess for some people, it's loaded with uh, unimportance. You think, oh, I'm just playing a game, or he's playing games with me, or something. It, it, it implies that you're trivializing or doing something just for the fun of it, and, and that oh, it may not be yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think that... I, I can't say that that factors into my opinion on it that much. I mean, people care about games. People have always cared about games. It's Super Bowl Sunday right now. No one's taking this lightly. 
I know. They're, they're the ready to game. play it already. Right there in the title. Game. Games can be important. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> the big game. That's right. We need to think about games in terms of the, the bigness of them and how much they can count for things. Sure. I think, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what was the name again? The thesis project one? This was Find Me a Good One. Um, so, the, the whole idea of the game is we were really like, kind of caught up on um, weird like mor- morality systems in games and how they don't work super well. Uh-huh. Uh, like I love Kotor as much as the next guy, but like it's so goofy the way you're like you see the choice options and you're like, oh, like I'm gonna if I'm choosing the evil path, I'm just gonna be like you are bad and I'll shoot you. And like the guy didn't say anything. And you're like, but you're doing it to get evil points because you want to play the evil character. Right. Um, and I kind of I don't love when those systems are gamified um, because I think they take away from the actual impulse of those decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, because if I'm doing something in a game because there's a system reward. Uh, chances are I'm not, like, factoring that in, like, my own actual ethics and morality into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think that that sort of takes away from it a little bit. Like, I think it's so cool in a game like Thief how people do the no-kill runs. And there's no reward in the game for not killing anybody, but people be like, that's how I'm playing this character. Mm-hmm. He doesn't kill people. He takes things, he'll knock people out, but he doesn't kill. And I think that if the game directly rewarded you for, like, beating the level without killing people, you'd have a lot of people who are not killing for systematized reasons rather than character reasons. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, our whole thesis was we want to create this system where you're exploring this dreamscape and you're trying to bring dreams back to your brother who's being plagued by nightmares. Um, but we really deliberately, we don't even have like sound cues or anything when something good or bad happens. Um, we really wanted the player to be like, well, they can choose to explore this dream world and just kind of play with stuff. They can choose to be really focused and help their, you know, get these things for their brother. But we don't want to ever be like, you win or you lose. It's just that these things happen. Hmm. And it's up to the player to decide how valuable that is to them. Uh, does it have an ending? It has It has a few endings. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's there's very deliberately not the good ending or the bad ending. There's the ending that you might decide is good. You might have an ending that you were going for, but as the creator and as the maker of the system, we didn't want those kind of ethics values to be in, incorporated into the system itself. We wanted those to be externally applied by the player. Right, because that would be more honest and real at that point when you gamify it. It, I think uh, it just has more impact. Like, the thing I always go to is, um, uh, like, the first Bioshock game, the whole decision to kill the little sisters or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and the game gives you equal abilities no matter what you do. If you kill them, you just get the atom. If you don't kill them, the, the nice lady gives you gifts. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, that, that sucks. Um, if I choose not, no, it kind of does, because if I choose not to kill them, the game should be harder. Mm-hmm. If I'm choosing not to be a self-centered asshole, the result should be that I don't have as much to work with. Mm-hmm. Sure. Because that's what that decision should mean. That's what narratively that decision means, is that I'm choosing to sacrifice my own ability to help these little girls. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If the lady is just giving me presents for helping them, then like that undercuts that decision a lot. It doesn't <laughs> matter. I can be the good guy and have all the abilities. Like, what is that? Mm. Well, you know, it's nice to reward good guys, I suppose, but it's not necessarily <laughs> realistic. And it also... That's what we're told, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When we watch movies and the hero does the right thing and like doesn't take stuff, we understand that he's sacrificing something, and that's what makes him good. Right, right. But they wouldn't, I'm guessing, want to leave the player feeling uh, as though they're being punished for being nice, Why? and therefore, yeah, because <laughs> they want them to. <laughs> I think like, that's a bad assumption. Well, I, I, I think, think you're right. I think you're totally right that that's why that decision was made. I mean, I know you are, but I'm kind of like. Why? If yeah. we're going to say the narrative matters, let's have it matter. Because they are... I got off on a tangent here, sorry. Oh, no, this is fun. <laughs> Tangents are the best. They're butt-kissing, and that's not what you want to do from the sounds of it. Like, uh, everything you were describing in uh, Find Me... Uh, Find Me a Good One. I keep thinking new one, because it's a new thing to me. Find Me a Good One. Uh, you weren't kissing a whole lot of butt with that game. You you yeah. didn't think you needed to put in a lot of cues you know, to, to show the player, oh, you're, you're doing this right, so continue to do this. You left it open, and you trusted the player would be able to make an experience out of the tools you gave them without a lot of uh, direction and pushing them or, or uh, patting exactly. them up. Exactly, and, and I will throw out, so like, if someone's going to hear this and like go download it and be like, what? Um, <laughs> if, you know... It was a student project. Um, there's a lot of things I like about that game. There's a lot of things I don't. <laughs> sure, that happens. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pleased with it, at least, and Hytham's art is spot on. Uh, he didn't just do the art. He was totally involved in the design. We both did the design. He did the art. I did the programming. That's kind of how we split it up. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. I love the hand-drawn look to it, and there's a lot of... I don't know if you've played, and yet it moves. I you have. Know, that game came, it just came out on iOS, right? Because I know yeah. it was out for, like, years ago on computer. I remember playing it on Steam. Yeah, Steam, and then it came to the Wii, weirdly enough. Oh, um, weird. Yeah, yeah, that game's got, got a fun look to it. Yeah, and also it doesn't... For me, anyway, it didn't lead me right away into things. It, it, it let me kind of figure things out on my own. I'm hoping that's where things are, are moving in general. Though the games you've done lately, at least from what I've gathered, Particle Mace and Extreme Exorcism, which you're still working on, uh, very much more in the arcade vein in general. Which yeah, are, left to my own devices, that's often where I wind up. Huh. Um, okay. I mean, I like thinking about game narrative and all that. I'm just, I'm not especially interested in narrative most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like pure little systems. I like how expressive systems can be. Um, I, like, ultimately, the, my game design tends to slant in a formalist direction. Um, I think there's a weird idea lately that formalist is a dirty word in indie games, and it isn't. Like, formalist games can be super, super expressive and awesome. I might be too dumb to know exactly what formalist is. I've been reading a lot of debates about what the word even means. What does yeah, it mean I mean it's 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 a contended, uh, it's a contentious word right now. But uh, what 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 do you take formalist to mean? So I tend to think that it's things that are are based really more specifically around systems, um, mm -hmm. like rules that you can write out, kind of exact rules. Mm -hmm. Um, so like something like Proteus, I would say, is less formalist. Right, because that's about. Uh, exploring the environment and not too much else. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's systems that under underlie and, like, control what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there's, like, no, no formal element there, but I'd say it's a much more kind of free-flowing sort of experience. Um, but I also think games like Passage, which I, I mean, I know it's kind of old at this point, but, like, I still find that game really gorgeous, and that's, like, an incredibly formalist exercise. Mm -hmm. like, the rules mm -hmm. are so clearly laid out. Um, we had Jason Rohrer on the show last year, and he was so, like, smiling but frustrated with, like, people calling that game just kind of a, uh, just an exercise in, in emotional expression. He's like, no, there's a system there. Yeah, it's I know. Cool. It's a real, dumb, dumb. It, like, it works because of the system. That's what makes that game so strong. Or, like, uh, what it, like even games like Dysphoria. Um, mm -hmm. which are, like, you know, really beautiful and tell this incredibly strong narrative. And um, a lot of the, what the, that game does is take really formless things and then subvert them. You know, we'll have, like, this very classic-looking Tetris scene, but you can't fit the brick into the space. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and it has this emotional... I mean, do you know Dysphoria? Oh, sure. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and so it's, like, this really gorgeous game about transitioning, and I think it's really easy to write things like that off as not formalist because they have this emotional weight and because it's not a game you can, like, win or lose, per se. But really, so much of the way those scenes work is by creating this classic game system that we recognize and then subverting it in some way to tell this story. I'm mm -hmm. like, so good, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Are those the games you grew up liking, games that were really systems-based? You talked about drawing Mario levels at three. Pro probably. I mean, yeah, I mean, I didn't play a lot of RPGs when I was younger. I wasn't, you know, I played like Final Fantasy VII and all that, but on Super Nintendo, I was definitely playing a lot more Mario World than Final Fantasy. Sure. And how about arcades? Did you? Are you? Arcades, did you yeah, no, I was into arcades. Um, Dig Dug was always my, uh, was always my go-to. Really? I'm like, yeah, I love Dig Dug. Still. Love Are you Dug. even? What's older, you or Dig Dug? Um, I bet <laughs> Dig Dug is slightly older than me. <laughs> that is so weird for me. I remember uh, buying Dig Dug on the Atari 5200, I think. They couldn't even do an arcade perfect port back then on consoles. No, I had, it, I had it on Atari as well. So my brother, who's um, like 14 years older than me, he had an Atari with a ton of games. So when I was like old enough, by old enough I probably mean like four, uh -huh. we, like, we got that going. Uh, and I was super, super into it. Yeah, uh, Dig Dug is older than me. <laughs> for me, that is a treat. <laughs> wow, you are the child of Dig Dug. You, this is what Dig no, Dug... No, I, I love... I mean, it's not a rarity, but I, I love the old arcade games. Hmm. And uh, then, but that's like, not... Asteroids, I mean, you can see in, like, Particle Mace, like, Asteroids has, like, a huge spot in my life. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. We, uh, uh, speaking of which, Particle Mace, yeah. recently released on Steam. Uh, yes, and, um, Steam and... and Humble and Itch and iOS. Oh, I wasn't aware of all that. Good yeah, to know. Yeah, the iOS one came out just this week. The launch got super delayed. Oh, it happens, um, yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, how does it play on iOS? That's the, the first thing people usually want to know. Totally, and it's a good question. It's actually funny. That game started as an iOS game. Huh. Um, yeah, 
in like 2011, I was going to make my first iOS game. I was like, I got this little idea that's kind of fun. I'll try to build that out. But then I kept being enamored with it and not releasing it. <laughs> uh-huh. So the way it works is I have this in my pocket. So uh, uh-huh. you, it, it uses a virtual joystick, which like I know before everyone gets scared, um, I, I don't usually love virtual joysticks in games. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've worked really hard on this one, and I'm actually pretty pleased with it. A few of my testers prefer playing on iOS compared to, a, like, a PlayStation controller. Huh. Which is shocking to me, but, you know, I can... Is this going to work? <laughs> yeah, it's working. I see yeah. it. Looks so good. I just have to try to play without being able to see. Yeah, All so right. you're swinging around, you got this thing. It does a whole lot of smoothing on the stick to make it work better. Sure. Uh, for a long time I had it where it would just fly to your finger. You okay. put your finger down, the ship just flies there, but the result was that you would cover half the screen with your palm Sure. if you're flying up top, and then you hit an asteroid, and then you get angry at me for making a bad game. <laughs> I think it was Tim Rogers who was on the show recently who was like, don't you get world. Um, uh, the, this is not exactly what Tim said. Tim, I apologize for paraphrasing you. But he's like, don't you people understand that touching things is what we do naturally. He saw a kid playing a golf video game where you could either grab an actual golf stick and it would read the golf movements, uh, but instead the kid just like ran up and started hitting the screen because it's like that was his instinct these yeah. days. Uh, and part oh, of the yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, knowing that, are you expecting uh, for me, this is very interesting being an older gentleman. Uh, I assumed the arcade days were over. I went through this whole period where games are about narrative and story. That's all anybody was talking about. I was still talking about Dig Dug when I was in my uh, early 30s, late 20s, and people were saying, no, it's Metal Gear, it's Tomb Raider, it's Resident Evil. And now there's this resurgence yeah, with people. There's all of them. There's room for everything. Well, if that's not what the, you were probably... 10 when this is happening. I'm aging myself. Uh, but they weren't saying, no, there's room for anything anymore. Sony was saying, we don't want 2D games on our consoles at all. Like, they wouldn't have Mega Man 8 on the console. Oh, yeah, but then they, they realized that they were wrong. But, I mean, even within that, <laughs> well, they, they did, though. They did. They did, and I'm, <laughs> I'm just waking up to that. Cause but they, like, well, so, like, yeah. when I was 10, this is like, I'm sure I just got an N64, Mm-hmm. And there was, like, this crazy buffet of just, like, all these games I could play. Because I remember, like, you know, like, everyone is when they're 10 and they're into games. And you're just like, I can't, like, this is so cool. Mm-hmm. Like, I can hold this controller and I can do all these, like, incredible things on screen. Mm-hmm. And I don't ever remember being or feeling like I was, like there was only shooters or there was only racers or there was only fighters. And mm-hmm. I, like, I didn't even have a favorite genre at that point. I mean, yeah, I wasn't playing platformers then the way I had been on my Super Nintendo. But well, I there guess there's still a couple on there. Yoshi's Story, Mischief Maker, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, there were, and I love both those games. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you're a bad person if you don't like Yoshi's Story. <laughs> straight up. But, uh, it is pretty much pure love and smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess it's interesting hearing from your perspective, because I still have this in, like, you know, childhood video game bliss, but I just felt like there's, there's so much, like, I, I can play a racing game, or a fighting game, or, like, a flying sim, or, like, a 3D platformer, like, whatever. Yeah, um, and here you are proving it, making uh, the kinds of games I grew up with, uh, despite the fact that some of these games are... I mean, Asteroids is probably a good 10 years older than you, I'm guessing. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> At least. So, uh, and, and this is my mistake, I apologize. We talked a little bit about Particle Mace, but for people, they saw a little bit of it, which is neat for, pe- but for people that are just listening or haven't okay. seen it. Describe Particle Mace for us. Yeah, so Particle Mace is a top-down space shooter without the shooting in this kind of vector style, very similar to the old Asteroids machine. Uh, And the way it works, you have a tiny little ship, and there's little enemies flying at you, and there's asteroids flying all around, and all you have is a bunch of particles tethered to your ship. So you want to spin in circles, and you just swing these particles around you and try to smash stuff up without dying. And uh, can you lose particles? Can you? Uh, what, can't what lose is par- the... particles, can't gain particles. Right. So you're, <laughs> the particles uh, you're born with are the particles you live with. That's right. And you die with. And you will die. Um, so and it, there's, uh, I don't know if this is on iOS, but there's versus modes as well, right? Yeah, so iOS is single player. Um, mm-hmm. So you have access to three arcade modes and then 150 missions that kind of interplay with each other in interesting ways. On Steam Humble Itch.io, you get all that, plus you get co-op and four-player deathmatch. Cool. Can you do co-op in the uh, uh, missions mode? Because I'm always most attracted to... Um... No, so missions is single player only. Um, mm. Right now I'm just taking a breath because I launched a game and I need to like not do stuff for a little while. 
Um, but I have some I have some things that I might do for updates and that sort of thing. And one of the things there is co-op missions. I think there's some fun potential there. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, but still, 150 missions, single player, that's enough to keep you busy for some time. How long have you been working on this game for? <laughs> uh, since late 2011, but um, not full time. There right. would be like large stretches, like six or eight months at a time, where I didn't touch it, because I was just doing other projects. And sure. then for the past year and a half at least, it's been a pretty like serious push on my end, where I was working on it for you know at least 10 hours a week. Oh, wow. And on top of uh, everything else at Golden Ruby and whatnot. Yeah. Huh. So uh, that's always really tough, in my opinion, when you've got a project that's been in your life for, like, you know, a sixth or an eighth of your life. Uh, it's been there. And you do things and learn things and change as a person in a year, and then you go back to the project like an old relationship and, like, catch up with it, and you're like, I'm not even this person anymore. Um, yeah, I there's, to go back. There's, Did you? there's some parts of that code um, that I hadn't touched in a while that I saw recently, and I was like, what was I thinking? Because I am a better programmer now than I was in, like, early 2012. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that, imagine. And, and, um, but in yeah, terms well, of... actually, but so that, that time frame and that kind of thing you were just talking about, about like, coming back to it, uh, often with fresh eyes, is part of the reason that I think the game works. Um, I'm going to be full of myself and be like, I, I think it's really quite a good game. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very pleased with it. Good. Uh, and part of that was... Uh, that I uh, so I really believe strongly in iterative design to begin with. I don't write big game design documents. I just start prototyping. Like I start uh -huh. prototyping. I play. I'm like, this is fun. This isn't fun. This is fun. This isn't fun. Let's amp that up. Let's get rid of this. That kind of thing. And sure. this game was that um, just over a really really long length of time. So like it didn't start with the whole particle mace. It started off being like this dumb space shooter where you huh. shot bullets. Um, and then eventually I was like, I should add a shield. That'd be kind of fun. And so the shield is all these, like, particles that um, were attracted to you but repelled when they're real close. So they form a kind of amorphous blob around you. Huh. And, and then after playing for a while, it became obvious. It's like, well, the shooting is dumb. Um, the shield is really cool. So I was like, okay, let's make the weapon just be the shield. And then, like, six months later, I came back to it after not touching it for a while. And I was like, okay, this is good, but it's too complex right now. Like, the shield, I was like, so you know what? Let's just lose the shield. We don't need the shield. It's just you hit something, you die. No more shield. So, like, that kind of thing... Just brings over time where I can come back to it and be like, oh, okay, you know, this all seemed good before, but now I can really tell that like this, the tension on the the particles is way too strong. It like bounces around way too quick. I need to like ratchet that back a little bit. Uh, so the system of iterative design, just over a really long period of time, let me just keep polishing up the good parts and keep removing or improving the bad parts. Right. And when did you get to a point where you thought, all right, design wise, I'm done. This is good. And Honestly. Then Mm. Probably about a year ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I finished all the missions at that point, and I might not have made all the multiplayer levels. Uh, I definitely introduced a few new, like two, at least two ships after that point. But those things were like add-ons. Mm. The, core, the core rules were, were there and unlikely to change. Sure, sure, sure. Just, you know, you got to polish stuff up, make sure it's good. Right, right, right. But in terms of actually going back to the drawing board, you were pretty much set. And there are different kinds of ships in the game? Yeah, there's nine different ships, um, and I've been. This game's been in various forms of early access for about a year, uh, and I'm actually pretty pleased. The right now, the online leaderboards don't show just one ship going all the way down. Uh -huh. uh, I've tried really hard to balance and balance them, and it's actually it's kind of funny having the issue of balancing ships. Um, I have to balance them so that they're all kind of equal in single player mode, and then I have to do a different sort of balancing on them to make sure that they're all equal in deathmatch mode. Yeah, but they have to be the same ships. Like it's it's. Bullshit if the fast ship... Am I allowed to... Cur how does oh, this sure, 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 sure. <laughs> um, if the fast ship is, for instance, you know, different in Deathmatch versus single player, like, that doesn't make any sense. So I have to make sure that they're all equal with each other along these two different spectrums. So it took a while of just yeah. like, okay, I'm going to remove one particle from the ship. I'm going to increase this other ship's speed, like, just a little bit to uh -huh. make sure that they're all evenly matched. And it, it's so hard, as I know, or at least what I've been told in balance... It, depending on who you play with. Like, you may play with people who just figured out how to use a certain ship, so it looks like that ship is really good. Well, and, and, then, and that's... Yeah, <laughs> totally. I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off. No, I'm, I'm down with that. Mm -hmm. I just... Uh, that's why I had a pretty large tester pool. Right. Like, or anything, it was probably, like, 50 people. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, but I, I mean, most people, I would, like, send out builds, and I would expect that, like, five of them would play it. Because uh -huh. these poor people, like, signed up for my test list a year ago and didn't know that every three weeks they're going to get another, and they're like, I changed some things, you should play my game again. <laughs> uh oh Guitar oh. chords, do you hear those? Yeah, I do. Those kind of rock. 
<laughs> Hopefully they go away soon, though, because this is your show. This is not Guitar Chords, this show. <laughs> I, I don't, that's all right. I don't fully understand why that's happening. Um, uh, I'm going to give it till done. We did it, guys. Great job. Uh, so Particle Mace, out now. People yes. can play it. People can play against each other in it. Do you feel like you're done with it, though? Um, For a little while. For a little while. <laughs> it, it is that a weird feeling to finally have this thing. Yeah, it's I mean, it's thing. it's definitely weird to have it have it out there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, because it's not, it's not mine anymore. It was in early access for a while, so like, at least I got this little... You know, it's like you send your kid away to summer camp before like they actually go to college or something. Sure. And I don't have children. Um, but <laughs> well, I imagine that's, that's what I'd do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> See how they live and try to help them along the way, but also uh, cut the cord a little bit. Yeah, and uh, for the, about the first week after launch, there was enough stuff coming up where it's like, oh, you misspelled the name of your game on the copyright screen. You should probably not do that. Or, like, there's a, there's a bug right now which uh, hasn't been fixed on iOS yet. I submitted it to Apple, but it's not. They haven't processed it yet. Of just like, oh, there's this, like, thing you can do that can cause the game to crash. Like, stuff like that. Sure, sure. Um, so for the first week or so after launch, I still very regularly, like, I get home and be like, time to start coding. Um, but I haven't been doing that in the last few days, and it feels weird. Huh? I'm like, I'm so used to it. I'm like, I should probably be working. And, you know, I got to that real healthy point where I feel guilty if I'm not working, which is always a good place to be with creative endeavors. Uh. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> uh, I was funny. I was just re- talking to a friend about this yesterday. A lot of people I know in their teens and 20s, their goal is like, how do I not have any responsibilities? Like, when I'm just sitting on the couch, like, not moving, that's when I'm winning in life. And then third, uh, late 20s, 30s, people are like, how do I always be doing a thing? Like, I oh, because I'm going to die and I need to be productive. Then 40s and 50s, I see a lot of people going back to just, like, well, how do I meditate in the most healthy way? And I need to commit to, like, having two hours where I'm actually just enjoying the moment. Uh, I wonder if you... Uh, game developers uh, that I know, most of them have an accelerated version of this uh, process. Do you feel like you're ready to relax for a little bit and just, like, not work? I think so. It's, it's hard. It's hard. Of course, you know, and I have a million other ideas that I'm like, oh, this would probably be cool, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, should, I should make this game. I actually, I stopped. I used to write down game ideas I had, uh-huh. um, and I stopped doing that because I finally just decided that if if an idea hasn't stuck in my head by the time I have time to work on it because it's been replaced by others, sure. I'm like, it probably wasn't that good. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't make a... so many games. I mean, most things I sit down to make, I realize right away, I'm like, oh, this isn't good at all. Okay, well, at least we tried it. <laughs> right, right, right. So <laughs> survival... Game design docs. <laughs> oh, sure. But it's tough with docs, as, as uh, I think you were alluding to before. You write it down, and it sounds awesome because you used really good words, and you know, uh, the, you can envision a game, and then you actually try to take those words you wrote down and, and put them into something you can play, and you're like, uh Yeah, well, there's, there's definitely that. But actually, even beyond that, like, I don't think I can envision a game. I don't know. Maybe some people can. I've actually I've, I've talked to Jason Rohr about his, his methodology of doing this, and he, like, he thinks of it all beforehand. Yeah. Uh, I remember I tried doing that a few times, and, like, I don't. Like, when I started Particle Mace, I didn't think of Particle Mace. I thought of this dumb game where you shoot at asteroids and things. I thought of asteroids, I guess, actually, right. uh-huh. um, with like some like vector field shit that I was doing. Um, I didn't think of particle mace, but I built it, and then I was like, oh, parts of this are fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I find that like instead of sketching things down in a book, I just sketch things with code, and that's really informative because I can play with it, and I can have someone else play with it, and I can be like, well, this is what works, and this is what doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, Extreme Exorcism, actually, the game I'm making with Golden Ruby right now, um, which will be out in the next few months. Oh, exciting. Um, so it's it's an arena platformer, uh, kind of tower folly, kind of super crate boxy. But the, the gimmick, essentially, is that all the enemies are exact recordings of your previous round. So you run around, you pick up a shotgun, you pick up a bat, you attack the target ghost, you kill it, round's over. Next round, a new ghost pops in, and that ghost is going to pick up a shotgun, pick up that bat, and it's like attack the same way you did. Um, and it's pretty neat. And it totally was not the starting point at all. Uh, I was going to try to make a multiplayer-only game. I think I was calling it Rise of the Fight Babies in my head. That was going to be a game about being overconfident. It was going to be like, you're just like, you die really easily, and there's like all these weapons on the field, and you're just going to like pick stuff up and like shoot someone and then just shoot someone else and then get killed. I wanted it to look like one of those like psychedelic murder scenes in Super Jail. 
<laughs> for people who don't know Super Jail, uh, Adult Swim cartoon, uh, not their most popular, but the passionate Super Jail no, it, 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 will not let it my die. heart. Yeah, it's been around <laughs> for a little while now. And uh, I'm sorry, just so, the, the, can I hear that name again? Rise of the... It was. I, I was in my head calling it Rise of the Fight Babies. <laughs> and oh, were they actually little babies? They were going to be like little babies. I don't know why. Um, but point being, it wasn't good. <laughs> like, Are well, you just, sure? No, so I like I just mocked it up, you know, like a gray box prototype. So it's just like squares picking up other squares, shooting at squares, uh, which is still enough to figure out if a game feels good. Yeah. Um, and like it, it, it just didn't at all. And then Mike, my partner Golden Ruby, was like, "I wonder how we can make a single player mode with this." Because he's like, "If we're gonna release this, we kind of do need a single player mode." Mm -hmm. Um, and he was like, "What if you just like clone what the player did?" And I was like, "That's dumb." Um, and I was like, but fine, I'll build it just to show you it's dumb. And I built it, and I was like, oh, here's our game. Like, was that this, good? This is right. our game. <laughs> huh. And then for, for people to understand the premise, uh, Extreme Exorcism, you're fighting ghosts? You're fighting ghosts, but the ghosts are just exact recordings of what you did. So they're almost ghosts of you in a way, or they're ghosts they that learn from watching you. Yep. Are they possessing you? Is anyone needing to be exercised? The house does. The house does, yeah, the house does. Is there a little destructoid guy in there? Yeah, there actually is in the attic. Our um, our artist put a little destructoid robot in the attic of that game. Oh, that's awfully sweet. I so wonder don't, if we're don't sue us. No, it would be more, can we review it without people saying that we only like it because there is, like, one robot in it that looks like us a little bit. I wonder. I mean, if that's the only reason you like it, I'm going to feel terrible if it doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, maybe you can take it out and then put it back in or something. We'll review it. We'll review the version that doesn't have it or something. We'll figure something out. Uh, but, yes, you've been working on that game for how long now? That game, um, um, probably a little less than a year. Just a little under a year, I'd say. Really? Huh. It seems so much farther along. And the art, who is well, there's, a, there's a team on that. So the art in that game was done by Johan Venet. Who what is, a neat guy he is. Yeah, he's he's cool. He's he was a French pixel artist. He just moved to Canada. Oh, really? And he's at uh, Tribute Games now, right? Yeah, he just got hired by Tribute Games, uh, and he he does killer work. He's super good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it won. Did it win something at the uh, Boston Festival of Indie Games? I don't year? think so. We were there. Uh, yeah. It was featured for sure, but I I don't think it won. So it's not in award category uh, nominations yet. I don't, I don't think so, but it's also not out yet, so give it some time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, what I was trying to say is it hasn't been uh, in a position to be put into the running for any awards because it's not done yet. Correct. Right, right, right. Exciting. In a few yeah. months. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it'll be, it'll be really fun. Uh, fun. And yeah. then what – after – so you finished Particle Maze, kind of. I mean – Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's done for now. I may make updates at some point. Um, I may make, like, a big-ish content update. Uh, probably not immediately. I wonder... I would say Particle Mace is a finished product. It's out of early access, like, it's, it's launched. Right, it is a, a thing. And soon Extreme Exorcism will be done, and it is a game that is done. Yeah. Then what? What do you think you will do? Man, I don't know. Um... <laughs> like, you may well, I mean, become rich. That might happen. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to go with that. I'm going to become rich. That's my plan. <laughs> and then what? Do I, could you see yourself just being like, well, this year will be the year of being rich. And I will no, I'll keep making and... stuff. I can't help but make stuff. I always make stuff. Yeah? yeah, yeah. That's, just, that's just kind of my default. <laughs> well, so far, so good. <laughs> well, I, like, I like making and tinkering. Like that's, that's pleasurable to me. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff on your website. Uh, there was the, you took the, one of the cyborg ninjas from Mortal Kombat and turned him into an avoid uh, karate man and dance game. Yeah, all Cyrex wants to do is dance. That was I always debate putting that on my portfolio. There's not even audio in it. It's such a, like so that was a homework assignment uh, for this web class I was taking at Parsons because I was like I can I'm like super good at C plus plus and Java and all these things and like I can barely make a website. It's still true actually. But so I took this um, jQuery class and I'm better at making a website. I'm not great at it. And so he were like, I don't even remember what we were doing, but we learned enough to like make a site that moves things around or something. And I just got into like a fugue state and like hammered this thing out in a week because I was like, I'm kind of learning jQuery and that's cool because this is new stuff. And I found like those Mortal Kombat sprites because um, like people just have them exported already, obviously, since Mortal Kombat and people lose their mind. Sure. Yeah. And that's like that's the extent of that story. I was just like, what's a simple <laughs> game mechanic I can program in jQuery? And I was like, avoiding things is pretty easy. 
the Z indexing wasn't too bad to do. It's oddly compelling. I I was very interested to yeah, see it, what happened it, next. Yeah, it worked out. I I played it. You know, if I'm making a game and I find myself playing occasionally, that's it's always a good sign. No, uh, did you want to put music in it, but somehow you were uh, stopped. Yeah, well, yeah, I had it was a one week homework assignment. <laughs> that week right every time. And it wasn't like I was like I wasn't hurting for assignments at Parsons. Like they keep you busy there. That's good. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, that was the game I led with for your story I, on I the structure. That. I like that game shows up every so often. Like not commonly, but sometimes I'll be like, oh, I'm like doing this game. Like, oh, did you make? Uh, you did all Cyrus wants to do his dance. I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> it is one of those things. Uh, we were talking about messaging and marketing and business and whatnot before. Mm. Getting straight into people's heart with something they relate with. With copyrighted characters. <laughs> yes. Because, That's how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you can't sell it. But it shows people right away. At least this is what I was thinking would happen. I was hoping would happen. And immediately the, the, the comments in the story started getting filled with dance gifts from various games. So people, it was resonating with them on, on some level. They took notice of it because uh, you showed them that you are like them. Uh, right away. You weren't trying to make money. You just think it's funny when the Mortal Kombat guys dance the game. And sure, that, I mean, I'm also trying to make money, but not, <laughs> not with that right away. And and uh, 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 I have to guess that if really what your chief concern was was money, you would not be making exactly what you're making now. You would have gone to Activision and EA right after getting out of school, like we were talking about. Yeah, I mean, if that was my only concern, I also don't mean to like. I don't want to like crap on people who work those gigs. Oh like, no, you, you didn't at all. In fact, you started um, that's, sentence with saying that is a very valid uh, pursuit. So yeah, clear right up the. Well, and I, so part of the reason is like I am I'm a programmer for sure. Mm. Um, but for me, programming is a means to an end. Like programming is an expressive thing for me. That's that's really what I enjoy it for. Mm -hmm. And so like I know people. I know people who are way better programmers than I am that, like, what they love is the act of programming. So, like, someone can give them some insane networking task, and they're like, awesome, I've got this ridiculously hard thing, and I'm going to solve it, and I'm going to come up with this super efficient way to do it. And, like, that's an awesome puzzle. Mm. Um, but that's never been what appeals to me about programming. Mm. For me, programming is like, I have a thing I want to make. This is how I do it. Like, I learned to program because I wanted to make games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I enjoy programming, but the result is that I don't think I would be as happy at a gig where I wasn't involved in the design. If people give me docs and I have to program it, um, that's just it, it, that's less appealing to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're the kind of person who like what you want is just awesome programming challenges, and you just want to solve that stuff, then like yeah, those like bigger gigs are totally legit and good. Sure, or or even a, a design gig at a AAA studio would that appeal to you? Like you need to make yeah. Assassin's Creed interesting again. Do it today. It would it would probably appeal to me more, but I think so. It's something you see in a lot of my games, and like Particle Mace is a prime example. of This is uh, minimalism. Mm -hmm. I really like minimalism. Sure. Love love minimalism, and so part of what it can be less appealing to me about AAA games is that there's just so much stuff going on, and I'm kind of like, oh, we have all these various things we got to mush together, and I feel like there's a that can muddy the experience. Where what I'd really like to do is make one just super super tight system. Like it's not surprising. Like I love Terry Cavanaugh's work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of it is because like he just takes one mechanic and just nails it. He just yeah. does it as well as it could be done. And of course, he does it as like punishingly and <laughs> he can as well. Um, and so like that was a lot about particle mace for me. Like you actually mentioned before, uh, you're like, oh, can you lose particles? Mm -hmm. And you can. No, you don't have to worry about it. Um, mm -hmm. There's no power ups in particle mace. That's extremely deliberate. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't by chance. And it was just because I didn't want to muddy the system. I wanted to have something that was this, like, brutally hard, fairly deep arcade game that was also super understandable and easy to pick up. Um, mm. You know, my parents play Particle Mace. Mm. Uh, and my parents don't play a ton of games. They play a lot of games on their phone, which is great. Um, but, you know, really kind of twitchy arcade games. It's just not for them, generally. But I think part of the reason they can play it is because it's like, well, you take this joystick. There's not even any buttons you use in games. You just move a joystick around and you don't crash. Right. You, you swing the mace with your movement. Totally. And, and, you know, and there's a lot to learn there, and you can get better at it. But mm -hmm. I very deliberately didn't want a system that was going to take a long time to learn. I wanted to have a system that you can really dive deep and explore the mechanics and interactions within the system rather than being like, and now you're at level two, and now you get, you know, the booster pack and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something um, depressing about games like that for me. I mean, that can be exciting and wonderful too. But a game like you design or a game like Harry, uh, Terry Cavanaugh designs, 
they keep you frozen in a point in time. Like if I play uh, uh, v, 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 and and it's the super graviton mode, like I'll play that for like an hour, but it'll feel like seconds went by because nothing actually happened yet. Everything happened like is always happening uh, at the same time. But if you had progressed, I would be like aware of the fact that I've just aged an hour by playing this video game. But instead, I stay locked in there, and it's a really nice place to be. Yeah, totally. Um, and you know, I play games with progression as well. I'm never particularly attracted to RPGs, but um, but I do think that is something that I like about making smaller games is the opportunity to create relatively simple systems. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, and simple not meaning lacking depth, just simple literally meaning this, it's a simple set of interactions that creates this really amazing depth. Yeah, simple language that you can use in a, in a versatile way. Yeah. Yeah, getting to know you has been fun for me, and I'll <laughs> give you some reflections about that. One of the things I've noticed in, in what you've said, when it comes to programming, you start from the bottom and try to lift up to the idea that you have had. But when it comes to design, you start at the top and like chisel away down to a new idea. Like you throw a slab of clay down. You're like, all right, I've got to pick away at this until it looks right. But the way you're picking away at it is is uh, bottom up with your programming. You're coming yeah. at it from both angles at once. That's not easy. <laughs> I guess. I mean, it makes sense for me. Like I said, I I don't sketch on paper. I sketch in code. That's not easy, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can't draw. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And, and, um, but also, but I do deliberately, like, I deliberately make, I know that my end goal is going to be a relatively simple system because that's something I can start sketching in code and I can start saying this is fun or this isn't fun. Mm -hmm. And I can and build it, off it. Do you, do you, do systems, programming being a system as well, and a lot of the, the programmers and game designers we've had on the show, one of the things that ends up coming out is that they're trying to share the joy of, and if you can call it joy, maybe you would, of programming and just understanding a system in a game. Like, they're teaching the player, like, if you can learn my system, just like I have to learn C++ and whatnot, you can yeah. do all the stuff that you uh, couldn't imagine that you've done before. Do you think you're communicating that at times? I, I don't know if I would say I'm communicating like a, a love of programming necessarily. Um, I don't know. It's almost more like a, a love of challenge, for lack of a better word. Uh -huh. I feel like that. What if I feel like I'm having a conversation with the player through my stuff? It's this kind of like shared fun challenge. I feel like a DM more than like a programming teacher. Right, right, right. Uh, presenting a world to them and and hoping they can navigate it properly, even if it's as simple as just moving around in the right way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh. I feel like that's kind of more the conversation I'm having when I make stuff. Who do you think? Who is your target audience, if you've thought about it in that way? So, I mean, because Particle Mace was a hobby project, it had the distinct advantage of the target audience was me. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, my target audience, I would say, I don't know exactly what the age range or anything, but it's definitely people who like twitchier arcade games. Mm -hmm. um, people who like... Uh, you know, kind of more casual games, which I'm not saying in a denigrating way at all. I think casual games are rad. Um, but I think people who are kind of more focused on those sort of games are going to be a little less into it, because I don't, I don't pull punches with games I make. Mm -hmm. I like it when things are challenging. Uh, I like them to be forgiving and, like, easy to restart and all that. But, um, but I like them to be hard. Like, Spelunky is probably my favorite game, and, like, well, that game's going to mess me up every time I play it. Sure, sure, sure. But um, there's so also... Think... I'm sorry, go ahead. So I, say, I think for the most part the people who are likely to be drawn to my games are people who play kind of twitchy games to begin with. And for the most, I'm like, especially games like Extreme Exorcism or Hermit Crab in Space because they're a little more technical. Um, you know, people who know how a, like a controller feels mm. are better off. Those people are going to be able to jump in pretty quickly. Um, folks who, you know, mostly play like threes on their phone or whatever, like Obviously, tons of people play Xbox controls, also play threes, myself a million percent included, 100 percent included. Um, but people who mostly do those kind of things are probably going to have a little bit more of a learning curve. But, you know, not impossible. I try to keep things simple. Sure, sure, sure. And I don't know the graphic info you wanted. No, no, it was great. You know, all your answers are great. Don't you worry about it. Down to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it's good that, uh, to me, it's usually a good sign that people, when they don't have a quick answer for that, because if they were thinking about their audience before themselves, from the very start, then it's much harder to get out a, a real genuine idea, and it's a lot easier to just try to win a popularity contest, which hasn't necessarily been what you're thinking, but you wouldn't mind being popular either, which yeah, I, I'll take it. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. No, but I, mean, I also feel like, uh, and I've talked to people about this, especially in like the iOS market. This, there's this, always this kind of sense of like, oh, you know what? I can just make the next like free to play whatever. Uh huh. Um, and like, if you're like a dev working like by yourself with the team of three, like, no, you can't. Like, you're not, you're not gonna out zinga zinga. Like, they're gonna do it better. Popcap's gonna make something that looks shinier. Mm-hmm. Like, why bother? Like, make something that's meaningful to you. Yeah. You need, like, you need a certain level of team size and money going in before you can even remotely complete, compete in the, like, you know, the high-level free-to-play market, pretty much. Cause, like, like AAA, isn't it, in its own way? I yeah. think PopCap, they make a shiny, shiny product. Uh-huh. People talk to me about uh, just a casual conversation. Their games come up almost every day yep. uh, at this point. They've been at it for a while. Though nobody would have seen, and I've talked about this so many times, I'm almost sick of it. Sorry, people, I'm sick of myself, <laughs> but it happens. Uh, nobody would have seen Minecraft coming, and maybe no, no one no, would see part- uh, Particle Mace coming either. It's got a, a simplicity to it that I'm guessing the target audience might be these kids who are fascinated with uh, the potential that they have with using a simple set of tools. They don't necessarily, like, uh, maybe I'm stereotyping here, but so many times I talk to somebody who's in their teens, their 20s, and they're starting to think, well, if something doesn't have a big narrative, then it's not really uh, fully capturing my attention. But a kid, I sat a kid down with Rhythm Heaven Fever the other day, and they were losing and losing and losing, and they did not care. They were like, this is fun. They're yeah. Because I am doing a thing, and a thing is happening, and I'm going to get better at this. And they, with tenacity, they stuck with it for hours. I think they only got through, like, two levels. It was amazing. That's Actually, that sounds more or less like my experience with that game. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like, this is great, it. and I suck at it. <laughs> And yet you stuck with it. I think those those are the games that, in in terms of formalist, I'm using the term properly, those are the games that impress me the most, that kill me, that make me feel terrible, yet I love them and I feel good at the same time. To be yeah, well, I mean, that's like what Terry Cavanaugh and, and Vlambeer do so well. Yeah, and um, you're like super so happy, I'm going to die in like five seconds and yeah, whatever. Even Maverick Bird, the Flappy Bird. Uh, yeah, I like, I like Maverick Bird. Um, yeah, I really like and, and Flappy Bird, for what it's worth. That game as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's super good. Flappy Bird is, Bird is an amazing game. Yeah, he, he pulled it off. <laughs> I don't know how he pulled it off. And I no, can it's, see it's why really people good. ridicule him. Quick restart, it like, has a system that's funky enough that it's a little hard to get a hang of it. Because the drop speed is really interesting. It's not a static speed. Yeah. You gain velocity while you're dropping really quickly, and it uh-huh. makes that drop super technical and interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I we wish you could have a boss fight. Though. You play it one hand, you can play it on the subway holding a pole, like, super well-made game. True. I want a boss fight, though. I want a Flappy Bird. I kind of always want a boss fight. I don't know if, uh, how you feel about that, but I, I do want a Particle Mace boss fight. Like, if you, do have, up- you won't have a Particle Mace boss fight. There is, the mission mode has an end. There is, yes. like, a final thing. A thing happens at the end of the game. It's even a little bit narrative-based. It's, like, slightly narrative. I haven't gotten that far yet. Exciting. Yeah, I'll keep playing missions. Um, Extreme Exorcism does have a boss fight. Oh, so, good. Yeah. I don't know what it is about boss fights. A lot of people think that they're the worst things in games, that they're cheap, that, like how you were talking about Bioshock's uh, morality system, that it takes you out of the game because it's kind of ham-fistedly saying, like, this is about being a good person or a bad person, and you're no longer being yourself. You're just, like, playing the system's morality code. Some people feel that way about boss fights, too. Not me, though. I think boss fights are often designed in a lazy way. I think Uh, they can be really good. I feel like boss fights are at their peak when they, like, you know, like, the, you know, like Mega Man stuff, where you're, like, you've been kind of learning how to use this new ability throughout this level, and then the boss fight should be the test of, like, did you really master this new thing that we introduced? Or, sure. like, this new thing you got or something. Like, that's... The Mega Man boss fights are awesome, because they do that really well. Mm-hmm. They rely super heavily on the stuff you just did. I don't like boss fights when it's just, like, here's a big thing, you have to dodge until he does his vulnerable thing, then you run up and hit him, and you're, like, eh, who cares? I like them all, but I do prefer the the boss fights that uh, we had Teddy Lee from Rogue Legacy on not that long ago, and they uh, made a very purposeful uh, decision to have the bosses just be versions of regular enemies, so you already had some familiarity with with how to fight them, but it's like an even harder challenge against them. Bosses in that game are so hard. Yeah, yeah, but not so in a way that ever feels unfair, like just throwing you a curveball, like, yeah. this new problem, it's, uh, it's always very honest. 
Hmm. Hmm, nice talk about Las Vegas. That's good. <laughs> I wonder if there's any questions coming oh, in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe this is uh, out of the live episodes. I wasn't expecting this one would be too hot because people love the Super oh, Bowl. They yeah, even right. close down. Yeah, the, the, the town I live in, uh, or close to, Boston, they even closed down part of Boston because they didn't want college students to mix with the people coming out of the bars because that was going to be like, I don't know, <laughs> an explosive combination in some way. Yeah, I, no, I see it. I, see it. I, but I think it's the college students who are coming out of the bars. I, I, think it's I would nice. assume so. Yeah, it's a very college-y town, this Boston. Uh, <laughs> Jason Jeffers asks... What programming language do you prefer to use? Ah, very nice question. Program. That is a good one. Um, so like I mentioned, Extreme Narcissism was Unity with C Sharp, but actually the one I prefer to use is C++ using Open Frameworks. Huh. So uh, Particle Mace was made in Open Frameworks, which is this, it's a framework for C++ that handles a lot of OpenGL stuff. So it does drawing, essentially. If you know processing at all, it's similar to processing, but for C++, and uh, it's mostly around for kind of like installation art. There aren't a ton of people making games in it, but there are more, because it offers a frame structure. You have like an update loop that's, you know, it's going to run however many times per frame, and you have a draw loop that's going to run however many times per frame. Hmm. And you can just do things you can call like OF circle, and it'll draw a circle where you tell it to draw a circle. Um, you know, it can display images and things as well, but I don't in Particle Mace. Particle Mace is all procedurally drawn, by the way, which I think is fun. Uh, oh, I was just going to ask that, and explain what procedurally drawn means for people. Sure, so that means every line, anything in the game is drawn by code. There's no PNGs or JPEG in the asset folder. I just tell the computer, draw a line from here to here to here to here. Okay, we're done with that shape. Fill it yellow. We're drawing a line from here to here to here. You know, fill that one red. Okay, that's an enemy. Huh. Uh, that kind of thing. And, and then did you get to choose how, like, neon and colorful and shiny and everything was? Yeah, I mean, I set all the colors. It's not... Um, Open Frameworks isn't, like, a set of pre-made shapes mm. or anything. It's just... Uh, it just kind of makes it easier to interface with OpenGL, which mm. is how well, things are drawn to the screen easily in C++. Uh, and it's really nice. I find I can be extremely expressive in it. I can whip things up relatively quickly. Um, Zach Gage has, he kind of pioneered Open Frameworks as a game platform. He did Spell Tower. I am almost certain um, Ridiculous Fishing on iOS is actually Open Frameworks, although I could be wrong. Really? I know uh, they had a, a dedicated artist on that, Greg Woolwind? Is that how I say it? Yeah, Greg Woolwind. But Zach Gage uh, was the one who did the programming. Yeah. Uh, I like, hope I'm not getting that wrong. I'm like, no, 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 you're, you're right. <laughs> I, I uh, you're right. That, that Gage also did BitPilot in uh, Open Frameworks, which if you have not played BitPilot on iOS and you want another space arcade game, just, like, check out BitPilot. It's so good. We had Zach on the show, I want to say, 2012, talking about those games, pre-Ridiculous okay. Fishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's another gentleman. I don't know if you spend time with Zach Gage. I've only... I think I've talked to him in real life twice, so I don't know him as well as I'd like to. But um, he also has done some uh, kind of outside of games but interactive electronic art projects such as you have. Yeah, yeah. He has, I mean, he actually taught at Parsons for a little while. Um, yeah, he has he has some interesting art projects. Yeah, he's, he's cool. We're not like besties or anything, but we both live in New York and do games, so we yeah, see so each other. Yeah, each other. That's pretty yeah. neat. And what are some of, uh, speaking of that, some of the outside of games art projects? You know? Oh, yeah, so I got some fun stuff. Um, so it is, it's, let's see, technically it's a game, but um, Doodle Defense is a thing that I've been very pleased with. Doodle Defense is a tower defense game I made a while back that's projected on a whiteboard, hmm. and you actually just use standard whiteboard markers, and you draw walls and towers, and a camera sees them and registers them and then projects like, so your red circle now will start shooting at the little projected enemies. Oh, wow. And the little enemies will literally crawl around the lines you've drawn. Did you make the little enemies and whatnot, too? Um, I actually, an artist friend of mine, uh, she, she drew them. Oh, cool. I mean, I designed them and what they do and how fast they move and that kind of thing. Right, but the visual design was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Neato, doodle defense. Yeah, uh, doodle defense. That was, that was a fun one. Um, is there a way that can be played by the layman? So it's not project. So if you if you have a Mac, a good camera, and a projector and a whiteboard, download the game for free. Oh, okay. Set it up. Um, it is also available on iPad as a kind of like finger paint ah. tower defense game. Okay, so that would change the mechanics quite a bit, but it still works. The mechanics are actually pretty much the same. Oh yeah. It's, it's, you know, you don't. It's a, it feels magical to draw something with a real marker and then see a digital thing interact with it. Yeah, it sure does. 
was really happy with that project. Huh, cool. And did you make a, a horse ebooks project? As well? I did. So I was really into OpenCV for a little while, which is like computer vision. Uh-huh. Um, having a camera set up and recognizing things. Like that's how I did the whiteboard project is the camera sees the lines on the whiteboard and deals with it and deals with it. Like that project was a nightmare to get going, but it was really exciting, fun nightmare. And then um, <laughs> uh, the horse ebooks talker was this thing I did. So horse ebooks, um, Twitter bot, love of my life. Uh, if you don't know Horse eBots, it's defunct now. But it used to be this thing that was theoretically like a marketing tool. It would just do this Markov chain searches. So Horse eBooks would just post things from the internet that didn't make a ton of sense. Like, but they, you could Google them. They were from somewhere, and sometimes they were like upsetting or weird. Like, it would go through all of these phases, I guess. Um, and it was just, and occasionally it would advertise eBooks about horses. So I made this thing where you would stand in front of it and it would find your face and uh, it would put a word balloon coming out of you with just a random horse ebook suite. Like I'm looking at some here, one of them, typically Daryl had left the. <laughs> uh, another one I like, dear internet friend. Uh, in the zone of trays, it rains during the summer. In the zone. Wait, it, they mentioned the zone twice in that. Yeah, in that one, yes. <laughs> just to make it clear. We're talking about the zone. Work from home. <laughs> Would you, um, if you yeah, were, was, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, I can't, when people don't, uh, aren't particularly drawn to a genre, and they've done plenty of game jams about this, I'm sure, too, I'm always more interested in what they're going to do with that genre. So you've said a couple of times that RPGs were never particularly interesting to you, or uh, as a genre, you were never drawn to them just for the sake of them being RPGs. So I was just thinking, like, well, make an RPG then. I can't wait for, to see what the, the guy who doesn't necessarily love an RPG would do with that when forced sure. to Sure. So, and I, I don't like dislike RPGs across the board. Fallout 1 and 2, I probably played through about a million times. Super sure. Mario RPG, I was all over do it. Um, so at Golden Ruby for a while we tried to make this game um, about uh, like it was about demons invading prom and it was like oh. you and like a group of the other kids at prom like have to like try to fight your way out of the school from all these demons uh-huh. and it was going to be a dating sim. Uh, it was like an RPG dating sim where like the kids are trying to date each other and you have to fight demons and so I had this whole like semi real time thing where you'd like pause the game and give orders and then hit play but so like you could like have the pick up items and like try to fight the demons but they could also like flirt with each other to build up their relationships. Huh, that sounds pretty cool. Yeah, and so and that was the issue. I'd be like, "Oh, I was like I'm making a dating sim roguelike." And everyone was like, "Well, that's great." Mm. Uh, and so I stuck with it way longer than I should have. <laughs> Cuz it uh, didn't work out. We like we kept changing things and yeah, it's just like it wasn't working. Every time we'd make a change, it would be like this game doesn't work. It's not fun. Huh. So someone else should do it, because I I don't doubt that the potential is there. Yeah, I I can't help it. I, I ask this of everybody who makes stuff. They will say, "Well, I made a thing, and trust me, it sucked." And then I play it, and I'm like, "Actually, this is awesome. You're a ding dong." And they're like, "No, my standards are high, or blah blah blah. Or trust me, I know this better than you do." And maybe they do, but I can't even begin to count how many games that I don't like at all that are hugely popular uh, from the bottom on up, so it's hard to say yeah, whether I mean, you're... It's hard to say, but I can certainly say that I don't want to spend like a year working on a game I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you should, and that is what's important. Uh, <laughs> but it is a pretty fun concept, and maybe... You yeah, know, it was a fun concept. That, that was my RPG foray. I also absolutely made a Star Wars text-based RPG when I was like 12 in basic. Whoa, where where can I get that? Uh, I am sure that one is lost to the ages. I don't think there's any back. I, so, like, I think you could play through the whole thing in like five minutes. Like I'm sure I was going to be like, oh, it'll be the whole movie. And like, I probably, like I think there's like two enemies you can actually fight. Not that you can fight good, because I wasn't using RPG Maker. I was just programming this in basic for Donald. Yeah, this is like Zork, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, I yeah except Zork is a good game. Um, <laughs> oh, I bet your game's not so bad either. It's okay if it's bad. I was 12. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Huh. <laughs> that is pretty cool. What about an RPG where the dialogue is e uh, horse ebooks horse generated e-book. based on what you do? Like, let's say you were to turn on the TV and then go put on your pants and then uh, go get a waffle and then leave the house. And then when you talk to the guy outside the house, he says, Waffle bed? 
okay, let's get the pants on, instead of what he would have said if he did those things in a different order. So that would be fun a, for about 30 seconds, I guess. There, there was a horse ebooks jam a while back. Um, my, my girlfriend and I and a few other people wound up making a game called uh, Disaster Wedding starring Chance Cowboy based on two horse ebooks tweets. Uh, but the, the, speaking to what you were saying, the, uh, do you know Baby Castles at all? A little bit. Not yeah, there's this, this like, awesome games collective in New York. They do really good stuff. And um, Kunal and, shoot, someone else from Baby Castles. I think it might have been Saeed, the, the two main guys. Uh-huh. They did, do you know Inform 7? Mm-mm. So Inform 7 is this like natural language text adventure engine. So the way it works is you can kind of write a sentence describing a room, and Inform 7 systematizes it, and then you can like, it kind of gives you a text adventure. So I could say, for instance, like, you know, the room has an exit to the north, and there is a table. On the table is a flower pot. And then someone playing the Inform 7 game should be able to be like, look at the table, and be like, there's a flower pot. Oh, wow, cool. And, but that? there's like a certain way to write it. So what Saeed and Kunal did is they took all these horse ebooks, tweets, longer ones, and put them up on Mechanical Turk for like, for like a dollar. It's like, if you, for a dollar, just translate this tweet into the language that Inform7 uses and then send it back to me. Huh. And so they got like 30 of these, and they made a text adventure where each room is just another Inform7 parsed horse ebooks tweet. Uh-huh. And, like, it, it didn't make any sense, but it's, like, this bizarre way of, like, walking through these tweets that don't make any sense. Huh, and it was all text-based? It, it was all text-based, so that's, that's the Horsey Books text adventure right there. Oh, pretty cool. I wonder, uh, you never know, as time goes forward, people just do things. We're just constantly doing things, people. It's always surprising to me. Somebody may play that and be like, I'm going to make this uh, a full polygon-based uh, RPG, uh, just yeah, like how people know. are, yeah, you never know, huh. Pretty fun. Huh. So, uh, looking forward with all the things you know, what do you think would be... And this is a hard question again. It's okay if you don't have an answer. But I, I can't help but be curious about this being 2015 and you're, you're front-loading the beginning of your year with releases. The tools that you have now, based on the tools you had last year, how do you think you can best apply them moving forward? What do you think you're going to do? I've been using the same tools for like three years now. Um... <laughs> In terms of what you've learned in other ways, perhaps. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say it exactly. You know, I, I become a better programmer with every project I do. Mm-hmm. You know, I learn new things and I just get better at it. But I mean, it, a lot of the stuff is so situation specific. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't have a. I don't have a fun answer for you. No, that's okay. Uh, uh, like, uh, I'll just keep getting better at the stuff I do. Like, it's a gradual thing. It's not like I had any, like, huge light bulb where I'm like, oh, now I know Unity. I'm like, you know, I know more of Unity than I sure. did a year ago. It's not that cut and dried of a narrative as you're getting better at a game developer that you just have that light bulb moment, but something like, like you mentioned Threes, you mentioned Spell Tower. Do you ever see yourself going in that kind of direction? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I really like those games, like, a lot, actually. Yeah, they're very good. Um, another game I want to give a quick shout-out to because no one knows it and everyone should is Stick It's. If you have an iPhone and you like Threes, like, get Stick It's. It's very good. What the um, heck is Stick It's all about? I know, I know. It's, it's this super, super good little, like, constrained space matchmaking thing. Huh. Very the abstract and, cool, and it sounds really nice. It's good. Oh, okay. Do you, do you <laughs> move sticks around? No, you move little L blocks. It's, everything is an L. Um, uh, it's, it's good. Oh, huh, okay. Stick it. We'll do. Yeah. Huh. Um, but no, and I've I've messed around with those kind of games a little bit in the past. Uh, it's very very believable that I would in the future. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I don't particularly know why I haven't. Um, you know, Destroy All Color was kind of in that direction. Right. And and the way you were describing it, in theory, uh, a game that you're happy with in practice. It was the tech, it sounded like, that let you down a little bit. Yeah, the tech got in the way. There were some things that were not telegraphed super well. It's a game that uh, a lot of people understood how to play, and a lot of people just, like, didn't know. So, like, we could have done the tutorial a little better. You know, that's the kind of stuff you learn. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so that's stuff that you know now that you might not have. But, yeah, I would love to make some kind of, like, little generative puzzle game. That would be super fun. Huh. Man, what what would the thinking go? Uh, What would the thinking behind that be to, to make sure that it's interesting, but not boring, but not derivative, but not too weird. Sure. I mean, I think the thinking there is, oh, I probably wouldn't worry about too weird. I don't know. That's, yeah. that's less of a concern. It would probably be I'd have some idea, and I'd, I'd build it, and then I'd be like, this is good, or it's not, or this could be good. And that could uh, happen tomorrow. You may just decide to start doing it. Yeah, uh, I mean, I feel like the only way 
especially with those kind of systems that are so abstract, the only way to know if it's entertaining or fun or challenging is to make it. Mm -hmm. um, like maybe some people can write this stuff out on paper and just like, no, but I can't. Uh, there's um, a really interesting email thread um, about threes that Asher Vollmer posted a while back. Because he'd been working on it for like a year and a half or something? I don't know, a while. And so it's him and Greg Wollin emailing back and forth. Well, now you got me with his name. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. I do that. Uh, and it's really cool, and they have a bunch of early prototypes that he actually is now hosting. It's because it was done in Unity, so that he just made web player prototypes. And you can see how much this game evolved. That it started off with this concept that was, like, interesting, but a little too complex, not as fun as it could be. Mm -hmm. And, like, evolved over time into this thing that, you know, we love that's threes. Uh, and most of what happened, really, was stuff was cut down. Huh. There was like a little avatar you'd move around originally who would push numbers into each other and then try to eat the big ones. Uh-huh. Um, and it was like, and it was cool, but it wasn't threes. Right. And, and threes uh, it's, is it's proven really, If you Google, you know, like threes, Asher, Vollmer, email chain, you'll find it. It's a long read, and it's a really interesting look at how these kind of games that can look so simple really have so much work that goes into making them function. Huh. Interesting, just how an email chain in itself can be that uh, gripping. Like you, you, yeah. You're, well, you're like I said, the demos are playable too. Like he would send Greg Wollen a build. I'm like certain I'm getting the dude's name wrong. People are gonna correct me, me in the comments. <laughs> uh, sorry, you, you know, he'd send him a build, and then they would like talk about it for a while. Right. Is that a, what do you? This is a, a just between you and me. Nobody's listening. Uh, what do you want like video game blogs to be these days? I don't know. I mean, there's so much stuff. I like, like, I follow Warp Door because I just often will be like, I'm on lunch break, and I'm like, I'd like to play something interesting that'll take about 20 minutes. So, I'm like, you know, I'll hit up Warp Door. Sure. Um, I really like, um, I'm less into, like, preview-type articles. I like when people, um, you know, will kind of dive into, like, why a game mattered to them. I like new games journalism. Mm. I think that kind of stuff is really interesting. It's hard to say. I kind of like essays more than I like articles, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Joystick.com, which has been around forever, yeah, no. they're closing, and people are, are taking that as, because there's been a lot of talk for the past year, like, do people want game blogs, or game blogs, should they die, or are they already dead? And I've always kind of brushed that kind of off, but game yeah. Joystick, which is a blog no one had any problems with that I'm aware of, sure. it's kind of folding. It's making me wonder what people like you, who are my target audience, <laughs> what I should do so, for you. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't read a ton of games blog. I actually get a lot of game stuff from Twitter, and that's also often where I'll get articles that, you know, if I see people talking about, like, oh, I really like this article, I'll be like, oh, I'll check that out. Mm. Um, I do feel like, like Kill Screen has often pretty good stuff. I, there's none that I follow super regularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I kind of bounce around, um, but I also, I don't, I don't think that, I don't know, I... This is one of the things like, oh, like game blog should die or whatever. Like, I don't know. I'll just I'll read the stuff I like, and you should read the stuff you like. And you know, that's that, well, right? yeah. That, like, that, if you're not, heated. if the blog isn't being like actively terrible, and like doing things that hurt people, then that's, I'm like, that's yeah, so, go for so it. So subjective, you know. Somebody wrote an article about how Pokemon's not that good anymore. That's like harmful to the Pokemon world. No, it I isn't. Think. No, it is. <laughs> well, I don't think it is, but I'm trying to respect it's, it's not. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is and there is not, and that is not. But yeah, some people get mad at game blogs because they feel their opinions are harmful, even if it's just an opinion about, you know, Fallout or uh, Mirror's it's, Edge or whatever. Not, not a harmful opinion. No, nope. it's not really. Uh, it's not. Yeah, not. Yeah, not, yeah, good. Yeah. not good to treat that stuff as an actual attack. It's not. <laughs> well, it, it really. Uh, it messes up your whole perspective when you do that, doesn't it? Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a few minutes left. I'm going okay. to curb oh, yeah. this discussion before we accidentally hurt a feeling or do something that we regret. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think I do. Um, yeah, we're doing yeah. Okay. Uh, I will say I once, uh, for Hermit Crab in Space, actually, we, we didn't feature trophies in the game. Oh, yeah? And um, I got well, uh, people were not happy about that, that there weren't trophies, which we couldn't do. It's a PSM game. Like, trophies weren't an option, but it, I had one comment saying, calling my game the death of Sony. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, that's, that's the best thing anyone has ever said. I love the idea that like, I'm powerful enough with my dumb little PlayStation Vita game to kill Sony because I didn't include trophies. And that would kill Sony because Sony is trophies, and you I killed think, trophies. I think so I think so. So yeah, Sony better watch out. I got I got the power now. Maybe we should just start calling them trophies. 
trophies PlayStation 4 or whatever. It's, it's very yeah. weird. It's very <laughs> weird. And uh, uh, Hermit Crab in Space, was that uh, at all influenced by Tumeki Fighters? Because that's what I... I don't know if you've heard of Tumeki Fighters. Tumeki that sounds Fighters. familiar, and I'm going to betray my ignorance and say I don't know it. Not honest. at all. Kenta Cho, uh, I don't know him personally. I've heard that he makes video games strictly for fun, that he's got... Uh, a job that uh, pays him well, but then when he goes home, he's just like, I'm just going to make as many shoot 'em ups as I can. He yeah. made kind of a uh, Ikaruga derivative shooter that I can't remember the name of. And he made Tameki Fighters, which is a game where you shoot a, a thing, and then it flies, and then you can grab it, uh, almost Katamari style, and you can keep grabbing stuff until your ship is like the size of the entire screen. Um, uh, yep, that sounds like it's along the same lines. Captain Forever is definitely the other one that... Um, I don't know weird. what Captain Forever is. Captain Forever is an old Flash game uh, with a very similar kind of thing. You shoot stuff off other players, it goes to your ship, um, and stuff can get shot off your ship. Huh, sounds pretty good. Uh, and I don't know how... Tameki Fighters, is that it? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I don't know exactly how that one plays. What we were leaning in hard for with Hermit Crab in Space was Confusion. Oh, yeah. Trying to make a ship that doesn't make uh, any sense, basically. But it's versus mode, too, right? You're fighting against another person? No, no, it's just... Oh, um, I misunderstood that, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so it's single player, but if one side of your ship is really heavy, that's going to lopside you and change the way you Exactly, move. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. You know, we made it in a month also, which was a quick turnaround there. That's very impressive. Well, what is that coming for this jam that Sony was doing. Yeah, but still, to, to, uh, not everybody could do it even for a jam. They just couldn't do it at all. When is that coming out? Is that out already? Power Crab in Space has been out for like a year. Tens what? and tens of sales. How the heck have I missed it? Son of a... <laughs> I feel like such no, a no one, no one owns this game. It's cool. Why don't they get this game, Hermit Crab in Space? Okay, so if it. you have a PlayStation Vita, yes. if you have a PlayStation Vita, you can go to the PSM store, the PlayStation Mobile store, not mm. the Vita store. If you search for it in the oh. Vita store, you won't find it. All but if you now. go to the Vita store and then click the PlayStation Mobile button, you can find my game. If you own this console that not that many people own and you know the secret code, you can buy my game. <laughs> I have heard this from plenty of PlayStation Mobile developers <laughs> who badly have fallen off and have decided not to even put their thing on PlayStation Mobile because I love Sony, but they try a thing, and if it doesn't immediately work, then the thing is gone. Like yeah, I mean, Sony's Mobile. been super good about indie outreach lately. Um, yeah. Actually, for the past few years, they were kind of leading that charge. Microsoft is getting on board now. You know, they got stuff like PubFund and all that. So sure. They're yeah. on it. They're good, but yeah, uh, Play- PlayStation Mobile was... It didn't quite work out, unfortunately. No, Same with PlayStation no. Minis. Just didn't really... Yeah. Some good games on there. Again. You, do what you do what you can. Um, so, to close, and we're now a little over time. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No, I enjoy it. People right now could play Hermit Crab in Space. just like They can. And they're immediately curious about you. They can do that now. You yeah. can, and right now you can also play Particle Mace. That sucker is out. Is it on sale? Am I imagining that? It might the Steam sale might still be going. It was also on sale on Humble or Itch.io, although those sales have ended because it was just for launch week. But um, right. Steam sale for launch week kind of was in stops and starts is a little <laughs> weird, but um, it happens. I'm looking at my website right now. I can tell you it is still on sale. Twenty five percent off Particle Mace on Steam. If you buy on Humble or if you buy on Humble, you will get a Steam code. If you buy on Itch.io, you're supporting one of the best new sites for developers and players for buying games. Yeah, yeah, it's um, I cannot recommend itch.io enough. It, that site is great. Itch.io, super good. Yeah, I hope, hope you don't mind me just like, plugging stuff I like on your show. And that, that, we want to know who you are, and that includes what you want to plug. 150 great. missions. That's going to keep people busy for a while. Probably. It will, and you get three missions at a time, uh, and they often interact with each other. Right. So, you know, you're not going to be like everything's totally wild and new the second time around, but you will get interactions you didn't get before. Because, mm, mm-hmm. you know, you'll get weird things where it'll be like, you have to get 200 points with only one particle, but, oh, also this other mission is causing the asteroid to spawn 10 times more than usual, so. Huh, uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds uh, quite dynamic. Sounds exciting. And yeah. oh, Extreme ahead, Exorcism sorry. is coming out on everything soon, or just one thing and then other things later? No, it, we are trying to hit all of them at once. Uh, it'll be on computer, it'll be on consoles. It's probably coming out April or March. Wow. All right. Yeah. Exciting first part of the year for you, and then yeah, and then I sleep. <laughs> I'm <gonna> hibernate. <laughs> People can follow you on Twitter and look at your website and stuff. Uh, what's all that information? Please do. Yeah, so I'm Andy Makes on Twitter uh, at Andy underscore Makes. There's an underscore there because I was dumb when I set it up. 
uh, Andy underscore Mace. You can follow Particle Mace at Particle Mace, exactly how you'd expect it to be, because I wasn't done when I set that up. Um, there's info about the game at ParticleMace.com. And uh, you can find out about Golden Ruby stuff at Golden Ruby Games. Very good. Thanks so much. Yeah. Oh, and at ParticleMace.com, you can buy the game right there. I got all them widgets. Oh, good, good, good. Smash that like. Uh, I am Tron Knotts on Twitter. You can watch the show later on YouTube.com slash Show. You can listen to it later on Libsyn and iTunes as well. And I guess that's about it. Are you going to watch the Super Bowl? Um, we'll see. We actually have a bunch of Musion fighters that we were, like, making our own salty bet. We, like, downloaded 80 Musion fighters that amused us. So that's what we were doing. <laughs> You're doing the Musion Bowl. Stuff. That doesn't sound bad at all. I yeah. think I, I might have to put together a, a, a news video about how The Witcher 3 has 16 hours of motion capture footage for sex scenes alone. Good grief! That's my that's job awesome. for the afternoon. I just, now I'm just imagining two people in mocap suits like grinding on each other. For 16 hours. Yeah. yeah. I need awesome. to just release that and then sell it for 60 bucks. I would buy yeah, that. Yeah, I'll pay 60 yeah. bucks for that. The box set. Very good. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. Take yeah, care. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks oh, for watching, everyone. Yeah.